Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the IEEE EMBS webinar series on the frontiers of uh, biomedical imaging and analysis. My name is Ping Kun Yan. I'm an associate professor of uh, biomedical engineering at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I'm the vice chair of the IEEE BIIP Technical Committee, which is the organization hosting the uh, webinar series. Today in the panel, we also have uh, Professor uh, Xiao Yijiang from University of Munster and uh, Professor Ji Wang from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Uh, Shang Li. Uh, he's the instructor of investigation at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. He received his bachelor's degree from the School of Electronical Information and Electrical Engineering at Shanghai Jiao Tong University and his PhD degree from the Department of Computer Science at the University of Georgia. After graduation, Dr. Lee joined uh, Massachusetts General Hospital and uh, Harvard Medical School as research fellow. Dr. Lee's research focuses on um, developing artificial intelligence solutions for analyzing healthcare data, especially uh, fusion across imaging and non-imaging data, and developing uh, medical informatic systems for the smart data management and AI deployment in a clinical workflow. He is the founding chair of the International Workshop on Multi-Skill Multi-Model Medical Imaging. He has received multiple funding support from the NIH uh, for his research on multi-model imaging fusion and clinical decision support. So Dr. Lee today is bringing us a very um, interesting and uh, timely topic um, to the webinar series. Uh, his talk is on the application and the development of uh, foundational models in healthcare. Without further ado, let's welcome our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Yan, for the introduction. So let me share my slides. So can everybody see that? Yep. Great. And again, uh, we would, I would like to thank for the invitation uh, from Dr. Yan uh, to this IEEE EMBS webinar series. And today I'm going to talk about the um, application development of foundational models in, in healthcare. So this is a pretty large topic and also pretty new. And like in probably one year ago, uh, we the, the so-called foundational models is, is more, more like in the uh, natural language processing domain, like the GPTs. And now we are seeing foundational models everywhere. So uh, I will uh, summarize what we have been doing recently on this direction, and also what we thought uh, along this line of research. So before I dig into the um, slides of today and the talk of today, so let's let's do a thought experiment for a while and think about like if we have a sorting algorithm that is extremely sufficient like uh, of the O1 complexity but only we only you have this algorithm so what you're going to do what you're going to do to utilize this algorithm either making some profits or making some new discoveries or something else so I have been always dig myself into this question and thinking like, when we are processing a extremely powerful computational engine for virtually anything. So, so sorting is just one of the many algorithms that we, are, we will deal with in our daily life, but it is one of the most basic one. So if we have this algorithm and what we are going to do with it and, and how do we leverage this for our research or for our products and for the solutions. A similar question and related to today's talk, we have already seen the extremely powerful capabilities of GPT-4. So we are talking about GPT-4 here because it is, it is significantly better than the chat GPT. So also like we, we know in, in, in probably several months, GPT-4 will be equipped with the multimodal uh, ability to also deal with, uh, for example, image data as well. So we have like omniscient algorithm like GPT-4. We have tried using GPT-4 for a very wide array of tasks and almost in all the tasks we provided to it, 
it can generate not only near human, but actually above average human performance and near expert level performance. So you will see in one of my our later investigations that it, it, it is nearly like the on the on the level of human graduate student to a uh, junior uh, expert in almost all the expertise. So now we are in the situation that we have this kind of omniscient algorithms and what we are going to do with it. And unlike in, in previous, like in our researches, we are developing tools towards that. So the similar thing we would discover, we have had discovered or we had experienced in the past decade is deep learning. So before deep learning, the whole field of computer vision, we, are, we were striving to achieve human level performance in many tasks. And now we have deep learning which in many of the so-called benchmark data set, it has already surpassed human level performance. But if we look at that retrospectively, what deep learning has brought us, and they did like, did things as promised it can do. So, and also it did bring real productivity to any of the field in either healthcare or other, or other like uh, sectors in, in our human society. So to my, vision actually the more important thing deep learning brought us is not on like facial recognition or the potential for auto auto driving but actually it's kind of like the data and algorithm foundation to the next iteration of the artificial intelligence that is what we are experiencing now the artificial general intelligence because deep learning presents us the importance of the representation learning this is a concept that was just there in the past decade and the importance of the model size and training data where people didn't realize that for a long time. And finally, it's the new paradigm in the machine learning, especially the self-supervised learning where most of the uh, advanced deep learning algorithms are, are, are relying on. So, so the, the algorithm and data perspectives that deep learning brought us is the more important thing and which lead us to what we have right now the artificial general intelligence. So not long ago, it is just a hypothetical program, which it will which assume that there exists some algorithm that can communicate in natural language, that can perform the reasoning, that can pre -pre represent knowledge. But now we have GPT-4, which can really do all of those. So, so the artificial general intelligence is already there. So it's, it's no longer a hypothetical program, but, but rather it is the, the GPT-4 is the solution. And then we, with GPT-4, we know there's a lot of things we can do, but on the same time, there's a lot of things that we are still limited, both because of the regular re, uh, regulation uh, limits and because of the intrinsic limits by GPT-4, now it is not open sourced, and even the data it used to train the model is not public. So we then we want to distill the uh, underlying mechanism of why GPT-4 can perform so good, and that will be the foundational model. So several characteristics of the foundational model I summarize here. The first one is, again, it is trained on a very large and diversified data set. So uh, at the same time, because of this, it usually implies that the model has to be trained on n annotated data, or at least with very limited annotations, because uh, we cannot basically provide annotations to so many data. And the second thing, the, the, the reason why the model is called foundation is because it shall be immediately applicable to unseen tasks, to unseen data and labels. So basically, it, it, it it can be used to deal with new, uh, even aspects of the, even new concepts of the of the data, and usually a foundational model is used to uh, perform a data embedding, which is then used for many late uh, downstream tasks we call it, and um, for different tasks. And finally, usually it is uh, embedded. It is equipped with a very large uh, parameter space. But of course, uh, recently we are seeing more efforts on reducing the parameter size of it, but still it is large. So the, the, let me talk about the first thing about the training of the model. So 
the key here in most of the foundational models, or the way we call it pre-trained large models, we are seeing right now, including ChatGPT, GPT-4, like and many other similar algorithms, is that it, it is trained you, uh, via the so-called so self-supervised learning, where the uh, base idea is that we we must some portion of the information we try to recover that. So not only it can perform the uh, image recovery task very well. Uh, and also tax recovery, like like I see here, but also it can it can perform some other tasks, for example, the noising task, for example, image painting task, also very well because of the nature of it. And finally, the the capability of recovering the misinformation from the context of the information itself is the way is the way of uh, learning the model from the data, as we see in ChatGPT, where the sole purpose of the original GPT model is to predict the next word from the sentence. So, so that is the its only purpose of the model. And so that's what I what I envision that is self-supervised learning and this um, like mask-based uh, like um, organization of the of the training procedure will be the key for the foundational models. And the second thing is uh, of course it, it shall be uh, have the zero shot or, or few shot learning capability. And it is, we have already experienced that um, the domain transportation, domain adaptation is the most challenging part to most of the algorithms we have, including image segmentation, even including image, image reconstruction. So it's mainly caused by the lack of diversified diversity in the training data. And that's why uh, like in previous works, we have developed a lot of federal learning based method that we can we can train the model across a whole spectrum of institutions, but still it's not sufficient. So because the key thing is the model size, we know that uh, most of the models that are trained on the limited data are are also limited by its parameter space and with the increasing model size. People has already been realizing the so-called um, emergence of intelligence from the Spartan model, but still is a unknown extent of how large it, it requires. But still, we need a larger model size to achieve the few shot or even zero shot capability. And also, it, the foundational models is the uh, foundation for the downstream tasks. And down, when we're talking about downstream tasks, usually we it's a it's a very specific task. For example, a segmentation task, or for example, diagnosis image based diagnosis task. And usually, because of the annot uh, annotation needed, so this the, the sample size is smaller, or we call it few shot learning cases. And and that will be perfect for the healthcare where the annotation is very expensive. So so that's why it rely on the pre-trained model to work and and as i mentioned it, it, the input to the model shall be already embedded data rather than data itself so like in five years ago we we, we relied a lot a lot for the uh, cv task for for pre for like pre-embed the data using the rest net uh, cases that is a very typical case of the of the relationship between a foundational model and the downstream task but of course, ResNet itself is not a foundational model because the sole purpose of ResNet is by that time was on the image uh, classification task. It is trained on, on that task. But uh, still, it's a, it, it, we, 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 can, we can see the concepts over here of the, down, the relationship between the foundational model and downstream task. And so finally is the uh, parameter space. Here, I want to borrow one figure from NVIDIA. Of course, the video is promoting the large models a lot, and on the on the model sizes, uh, the growing of the model sizes, and we have already been very uh, astonished by the Nvidia's Megatron by that time, by by the by nearly twenty twenties, where it has oh, uh, around eight billion number of parameters, and then we see GPT three, which is one seventy five billion, and that is makes it impossible to be experiment with. In, in 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 most of the uh, in most case of the world, and now we uh, hypothetically, I think the uh, the Nvidia is having this Megatron Turing, which is over five hundred billion parameters. Of course, that is a multimodal uh, a model, and uh, with the capability of dealing with images as well. 
and and the, this kind of like linear growing trend of the of the parameter space um, basically can show us a lot on where we are going right now and also on the importance of of um, being able to fine tune our model from using a more smarter way so with all of this uh, like uh, development in the in the in the artificial general intelligence and foundational models a lot of the Im imitations are also presented so first of all actually what i concern most uh, in in the general domain is the in inequity in inequity so because larger models needs more computational power that is gpus and usually involves more uh, labors so smaller institutions will have a a very lack of competence with the larger institutions, which is kind of a damage actually to the whole ecosystem. And also in a lot of applications, the uh, AGIs are still limited to certain tasks. And the most prominent one we are seeing right now is SAM, which is very powerful, but also is only limited to the segmentation task. And <clears throat> one thing I, 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 I talked through all the slices before is uh, there's a lot of unknowns here. We do not know like what data size we need for really training or even fine tuning a foundational model. We do not know what model size is needed. That's why people are investigating the uh, growing number of larger models. And we do not know like to what performance that we will be kept. So, so of course that is totally reasonable because it, it has been only like one to two years since the emergence of these whole topics. So everything is still unknown, and that of course provides us a lot of opportunity as well. And to the field of the uh, healthcare, the two limitations or two challenges is that first one is the data. So the access to the data and access to knowledge in the healthcare domain, we I, I said it's specialized domain that and, and here is healthcare. And it's challenging for the foundational models which are trained in the general domain because here our data are protected and isolated we call it data silos so it will be then very hard uh, for their models to be trained on massive uh, number of data uh, data uh, data as done before and we find i had to find some way or find some mechanism that we can allow using the data and the second thing is the integration of multimodal data in in like a uh, general domain, the uh, multimodality characteristic is not that prominent where, for example, ChatGPT, we can already handle most of the tasks we want. But in medical domain where the decisions are usually or even like major, majorly made with the, with the um, consultants to multiple modalities of the data, for example, for the patients, when, whenever a, a decision is made, of course, the physician will need to rely on the on the patient's uh, EHRs and the images, and also even the discussion, a panel discussion around around the physicians. So this multimodal uh, data uh, fusion is going to be a challenge and also the uh, pain point for the foundational models. So. And then I here I jump to what we have done in the past year, like uh, generally past year. So we we are a uh, very loosely uh, collaboration between the institutions listed over here, and specifically we we have um, uh, expertise from the backgrounds of computer science, from uh, clinical, and from biomedical engineering, and from bioinformatics and from medical informatics and from oncology especially our collaborations in mayo clinic and and uh, and also uh, from the uh, expertise in data science and even neuroimaging that is from my uh, phd supervisor tian ming so with these uh, collaborated works when we have uh, been we have been doing uh, some researches along this line of the uh, agis for healthcare so before we we mainly focus on medical imaging and but now um, a lot of the works we we are performing are on uh, the fusion between image and text so again data in, in healthcare is, is has a barrier and that's why we need these collaborative efforts so at least right now we have the two institutions 
uh, probably the largest hospitals in the United States, the Mass General and Mayo. And we are gathering uh, cross institution data to support the uh, investigations. So, some of the most important um, assumptions here is that uh, we, we want to have high quality data and with good interpretability of the model and, and also in, ensure the accessibility of the data by the models so that the large models can be trained. And finally, is the, uh, the grounding of the AGIs for the knowledge and that's related to how the domain knowledge can be fused with the model part, which I will I will very briefly uh, tackle in the later slides. So uh, these slides I, ha I have just uh, actually talked about that is the importance of the foundational models, which is quite obvious. And one thing, I uh, the last item I listed here is very interesting that not only it is useful for the uh, clinical decision making and, and patient care, also it is very interesting by the hospitals where the whole uh, pipeline of workflow can be optimized, for example, bidding. And that's, that's one of the major uh, projects we are doing right now with the uh, high level uh, people in the mass general. We try to, we try to leverage the capability of the language processing models uh, to uh, optimize the biddings uh, for the hospitals. So here I list some of our uh, works which are mo mostly like uh, available on archives. You can you can search their, their names and you will see them. So including uh, the uh, categories of general text processing, the first work is the uh, OCGPT, which, and also the <coughs> adaptive learning using ChatGPT. And a lot of our works in healthcare, including identification, including uh, medical exam, uh, uh, the, the medical ex exam, exam taken, the cohort establishment, the uh, writing or the summary of the regular reports, and the uh, image text, uh, image, text embed, image text embedding, as well as our most recent works for this uh, multimodal functional model, so-called biomed, biomed GPT. And also uh, how to fuse the uh, knowledge with the uh, uh, large models. We, we have this chat graph, which I will talk about later. So the OCGPT is our first model in, 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 in trying to use ChatGPT for any task. And here we use that for the future learning in, in healthcare. And by that time, we, we even do not have the uh, APIs for ChatGPT. So we asked a lot of students to perform in these experiments uh, using the web UIs. But the, the results are astonishing well. So that means uh, um, a previous like uh, research topic in NLP, that is the data augmentation, basically is gone. The, the 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 whole practice of performing like data augmentation can be substituted by the uh, ChatGPT and which which outperforms uh, all of the current uh, method. And then the identification, which again is a very challenging task previously in healthcare uh, informatics, but now we see uh, uh, this time we are using GPT four can 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 do that ex extraordinarily well. So. One thing I learned from this work is that GPT-4 is not only very good at uh, basically generating text, but more importantly, it's very good at reasoning and recognizing the entities in the text. For example, given giving a report here, the name, even, even which is, can be confusing to the humans, can be very easily recognized by GPT-4 and then the, the idea it. The names, the date of birth, and the uh, dates, and also telephone number, all those, all those HIPAA, HIPAA uh, identifiers can be identified by the uh, GPT-4 as long as we tell them to do so. So that is astonishing. And uh, the exam GPT where we uh, compose a, um, a uh, examination uh, exams for the uh, oncology physics. So, so we we uh, the, our collaborators in Mayo Clinic compose these exams with the 100 questions and ask uh, different uh, language models to answer that. And as I mentioned uh, before, the the performance of the of the GPT-4 even outperformed the medical uh, medical physicists in uh, Mayo Clinic. So 
in in a lot of the in a lot of the question question categories, and for example, uh, in, in average, okay, if we are seeing this this sub figure in all all questions panel, on average, GPT four outperform the medical physicists in these questions where we uh, manually compose them. And the impression GPT where we perform a text summarization task. Uh, from the uh, reader reports uh, finding section to the impression section with usually two to three sentences. This is, this is although seems a simple task, but actually it's very important because the impression section, which can be later used for the input uh, for uh, like uh, image text models and also can be used to uh, like uh, convey the, the, the information to the patients. So text summarization has been a long studying area in the data science as well as NLP, but now we are seeing the uh, with some tweaking on the on the prompt, we can achieve a very good results using the GPT-4. And here is the biometric. This is different from, from the works before, where actually here we develop our own foundational models and based on BERT and a MAE mass autoencoder to learn the um, embeddings of the multimodal data. So our collaborators in Lehigh University, they collect uh, more than 40 data sets of various imaging and text modalities. And some of them are, are pretty large. For example, the Mimic itself is a, is a multimodal data set. And some of them can be smaller. For example, these uh, I found those uh, images. But but they assemble all of those, all those in a integrated data set and then using the Self-supervised learning to train a multimodal, uh, basically a multimodal embedding uh, machine, and then this so-called BioGPT can be used as the uh, like basis for for a very wide variety of downstream tasks. We are still investigating what it can do, but but in, in the tasks that we have examined, it can achieve sort of performance. For example, on the on the uh, VQ, uh, VQA. Uh, task the the question answer task and the um, image feeding or image denoising task in the classification task and so on so so this gonna be like one of our major directions in the future research where we are going to improve this so-called biomed GPT with the more uh, advanced algorithms like right now we are using BERT and now of course we can use GPT as well and and in, and feed that with more data types so that uh, it can probably uh, do, do a lot of the common uh, medical image and medical test uh, tasks better. And this is related to one of the works in, in, by the postdocs in our lab, which is the image test mod, uh, autoencoder, which, where we learn the co-embedding of the uh, image and text together. That is, that, that's one part of the whole uh, like foundational model uh, development efforts from us. And in, in overall, uh, we, we envision that, we envision that the fusion of the image text and other modalities, here we are talking about other modalities, for example, the genetic sequence data, and more importantly, the uh, EHR data, which are tabular data, and the fusion of those is what humans have been doing, the human, the, the physician has been doing to evaluate, to diagnosis, to treatment planning of the patients. And that will gonna be the ultimate form for the, both the, uh, for the healthcare's AI. And we envision this foundational model, for example, the Biomat GPT. We can allow this integrated representation and intergeneration across modalities. So we haven't investigating the gender, uh, generative modeling using the biomed GPTs, but because that will involve a much more complicated decoding structure, but that's, gonna, that's definitely gonna be the next step. Especially one thing we are, we are working right now is the so-called image text to image, where we can learn a generation model there that can generate the, uh, for example, radio reports to the radio image in a, uh, two ways uh, fashion. So this kind, of, this kind of a holy grail in medical image analysis, because the, in a lot of the cases, the sole purpose of the 
of the CADs, the computer aided diagnosis machine, is to know like what the what the image are presenting and and mimic what humans do. So, uh, if like we can achieve that, that and then it can greatly assist the uh, radiologists and, and decrease their burdens and or even uh, like what which like uh, Dr. Ye has been doing a lot on the incidental findings that will highly facilitate these uh, operations. So as I mentioned here, the, even the imperfect version can be very useful because uh, we can then uh, get in some uh, like very rough diagnosis or findings on the images based on this image to text to image model. And also the uh, generability of the image, the, the, the generative modeling of the images will allow us to better capturing the uh, underlying feature space of the, of the whole embedding model. And uh, the one thing that we are, uh, serves as the primary <coughs> premise of our uh, biomagic model is the model that can span across a very wide variety of the imaging modalities and conditions. So one thing that is uh, very important uh, for the uh, traditional AI is the imaging conditions where the, where the performance of the model will degrade with the different uh, scanners, for example, or diff even different scanning parameters on the same scanners. So our hypothesis is that we, we, we need to gather as much data as possible. Uh, and, and the diversity of the data used to train the model will greatly uh, deal with these uh, challenges. And so also like we, we have been thinking about go beyond this nodal detection uh, capability of the medical imaging AIs a lot. And we believe like a general purpose AI that can uh, like deal with the most common task in medical imaging will be the next stage in the, in the uh, radiology AIs uh, development. And some technical uh, like uh, details that regarding our vision about the next step in the uh, foundational models for healthcare as well as AGIs is, is the tokenization that is a less discussed topic, but actually very important for uh, the pre-processing and the pre preparation of the data. So previously also in the biomedical GPT model, we use uh, simple patches of the, of the image as the, as the uh, tokenizer. But there are more choices that we are investigating, for example, super pixels or even smart semantic objects that derive from, from SAM, for example. And finally, uh, our, our vision about the foundational model and especially how to train that is its relationship with the medical informatics, which myself has been working on for many years. So basically, how do we link the rich resource of data? And, and of the physician's decision in the hospitals with the AI system is kind of the bottleneck where a lot of the current efforts are very isolated. For example, we consult with say, one or more physicians or radiologists and we get some data from theirs and then we start training a model and then we test the model on, on, on the same institution. And supposedly the, the, the thing is, it's more like a self-driving where the data are automatically collected with the changing of the scenarios and which with the changing of the patients. So covering all the dynamics in the hospitals and summarizing this data into the flow fed into the models. And that's the that's our scenarios in, in our vision. So as I mentioned here, the continuous generation of high quality data is the key for training a very large scale model. And that's, of course, is related to how the information is stored and transferred, and that is the medical informatics. So uh, I think we are we are right now uh, very uh, advanced in that in at Mass Generals, which which we are working with the uh, team of coordinating the uh, data informatics system for kind of randomly generate uh, randomly accessing the data in the hospital's uh, uh, imaging storage 
by the models without the interference of the of the of the many interference. So that is one thing that we are doing right now. And second thing about the informatics and actually more related with how the humans are involved is how can we coordinate and support the uh, feedbacks to the models training from the human experts. One of the most commonly used way is the reinforced learning with human feedbacks. And that involves how do we interact with the humans. So that's also something we are investigating right now. We are, we are different ways and different user interfaces. And the final thing is how to, how can we de deploy these uh, foundational uh, models either as a computational engine uh, at one or more hospitals or as in some uh, edge devices that that can be used uh, like uh, at the devices level. So finally, our perspective the the most important one is called, of course AGI is inevitable. We, we usually compare that to the, uh, the emergence of deep learning around 10 or 15 years ago, but this time it is even more prominent and even more disruptive. So we already seen as I, as I talk in the tax summarization and uh, tax augmentation task, a large number of NLP tasks has been dramatically changed at least or even diminished by the ChatGPTs and gpt 4s and which going to be followed by the computation task as well. So if we think before the uh, emergence of the deep learning, we were using like filter banks, we were using dictionary learning, we were using SIFT features to analyze our image. And now uh, like very few uh, researchers are, are using them. But on the, on the same time, we will find inspirations from previous works and even even on this we, what we call traditional techniques for uh, like smarter ways of outlining the uh foundational models and and that and that's a lesson we learned in in the in many past tasks that that a theorem developed like 20 years ago can be the guidance of 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 a very important new new findings and finally, uh, it's, uh, for the academia researchers, so we are experiencing a new paradigm of research. And uh, I mentioned about the potential inequity brought, uh, brought by the uh, forthcoming of the AGIs. But on the same, at the same time, that gave us a, a very powerful tools for any of the research. So, so the opportunities and risks are both presented. And that's all for my slides. And thank you all for the time. So any questions? Thank you, Sean, for the uh, uh, very nice talk. Uh, for, thank you for sharing your vision on the foundational model and the multi-model uh, fusion. That's very inspiring. Now we can uh, open uh, the webinar to the audience for questions. Any question from the panel? Uh, uh, may I ask one question? Sure. Uh, Thanks also from my side for the very nice talk. Could you go back to the slide for tokenizing, well, how did it call it? Uh, uh, patches, yep. and super pixels, and the last item there, semantic, uh, how? Yeah, smart yes. semantic objects. Smart semantic objects. Yep. Uh, the point is, uh, it makes sense to search for such smart semantic objects, but uh, technically, uh, could you say some words about uh, how this go could be achieved, uh, uh, particularly in a medical context? Um, that is related to the recent development of the general purpose uh, segmentation tool, that is SEM, segment ah, anything model. Okay. Yeah, we have been uh, investigating the feasibility of SEM on our medical data on very uh, on a very large. Uh, collection of modality, including the CT, MRs, and ultrasound, and so on. So, mm -hmm. in in a nutshell, in a nutshell, SAM performs surprisingly good on a lot of the cases. Mm -hmm. So, there's a lot of thing to be improved, especially on the stability of it. But, for example, uh, on our most recent work on the echocardiography, SAM has already surpassed the uh, very carefully trained mm -hmm. unit. So mm -hmm. that means, but on the same time, keep in mind it is uh, like zero shot. So that means 
we can use SAM for kind of pre annotation of our data mm -hmm. and uh, semantically divide the image into meaningful uh, distinct regions and then which can be used for uh, tokenizing the image and, and for a lot of, of course a lot of other other purposes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Xiao, I think uh, your presentation is uh, excellent. Would you please uh, just on the same slides uh, comment more on uh, tokenizing dynamic medical image? So the time dimension, do you have any specific comments? Uh, to tokenizing it me uh, usually involves like transforming the um, the image to smaller patches. But of course, think about transforming this transformation process. If we add a time dimension, then that could be like we are not generating patches on the spatial, but rather on the temporal domain. That is, in another sense, that is more videos. So uh, our current Biomat GPT can actually handle the videos uh, by taking taking the image series. But I believe there's a lot of things to do on the so-called spatial uh, temporal uh, modeling where the um, where actually the temporal relationship between the frames can be better better utilized but in 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 overall i believe like tokenizations on the temporal and the temporal direction is very useful and very like uh, can be can be a better approach than tokenization on the on the spatial on the, sp on the spatial domain Thank you very much. And I saw a lot of questions in the chat window, so go ahead. Yeah, I I cannot see them actually in the current, uh, with the current slides, so. Okay, no problem. I can uh, read one for you. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, I can see them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the first question from uh, uh, Jing Xuan Wang. Yep. Uh, how to uh, improve the interpretability of the results of a foundation model? What kinds of techniques are used? Yeah, this is a very good question. Then something we have been thinking a lot uh, during the development of the Bellman GPT and as well as other models as well. That because the nature of the foundational models is it serves as the uh, prerequisite to the downstream task. So one thing is, of course, interpretability of the foundational model rely on the interpretability of the downstream task, but that is that is only like one part of the of the answer. But more more importantly, how do we know, or how do we extract, how do we extract the knowledge that has been uh, it has been stored? in the, for example, the network that we use to model the foundational model. That is the more important part. And actually this is a very new and, and, and but on the other hand, very hot topic. For example, I have, we have already seen open eyes in trying to know exactly what GPT, a uh, chat GPT is thinking or what chat GPT is the knowledge of the chat GPT using another, use another like GPT-4 model to extract knowledge from the model itself. So that's related to the interpretation of the foundational models. That is, we already know the foundational model learn a lot from the data and it can uh, represent the data very well, but exactly what has been learned is the question. And that's, re and that's related to how do we interpret or how do we, how do we know our models? But that is a extremely open question. Um, I do not have a ready answer for that. I, I, but I, we do know that it's, it, is, it is an important question. Thank so, you, yeah, the question about fusing clinical time series data, uh, yeah, that's related to uh, Dr. Wang's question. So again, we believe like the tokenization on the sequence, uh, because for example, uh, for the ECGs, EEGs, and other uh, time series or time signal modalities, Actually, it is very easy to be uh, uh, compared with the text because they are all sequence data. And it is not only all sequence, it is one directional sequence data. So the tokenization of these models shall be better performed on the temporal, uh, temporal direction. So similar to what we separate the sentence into 
into uh, words by the vocabularies. We shall do the same for the time series data as well. Uh, yes, I, I believe uh, Ping Kui, you will share both the slide, uh, the, the, the video of the, today's talk, right? Yeah, I, uh, we are recording right now. The video will be posted to our YouTube channel yeah. uh, once it's available. Great. And about the uh, image modalities we have considered. So we have consulted with the uh, radiologists and physicians in Mass General as well as in Mayo about what images shall be included and shall be better included in the biomass GPT model. So right now we are uh, targeting mostly on the CTs, both contrast and non-contrast, the MRs, and MRs, uh, both CT and MRs on, on various uh, locations, including brains, including chest and, and pelvic and so on. So we try to cover as many locations as possible so that we can make the foundation model really useful. And uh, we have uh, covered ultrasound, and, and also the microscopic images and pathological uh, pathol uh, images as well, as well as the fundus images uh, that is that is can be roughly uh, categorized into the uh, uh, microscopic image, uh, microscopic image, and also uh, a lot of the text data, of course, clinical notes, radio reports, and so on. Yep, I believe I've go go through all the yeah. questions in the chat box. Uh, great, <clears throat> thank you, Sean. So, uh, maybe just uh, one um uh, more question for clarification. So, in the beginning of the talk, you mentioned the foundational model. There are several characteristics, and also you mentioned that ResNet uh, is not a foundation model, uh, although actually it can be pre-trained and people use for backbone, etc. Yeah, can you please clarify that uh, what exactly makes like a the foundation model or foundation model, but the rest of that is not. Are there any open public available foundation model in the medical uh, informatics domain? So first of all, why I do not think the pre-trained large models like ResNet is not the foundational model is due to its nature of training. So it's trained on the on the uh, on a very specific task. So although the task itself is reasonable, that is the uh, predicting the labels of the image, but is is limited. So my unlike, for example, the GPTs or even BIRDS, which can be more considered as a foundational model because the task is a very uh, like open task. The prediction of either the next word or the mask word of a sentence is is a very general like uh, basis for you can think of almost all the language tasks. Okay, if we think about how ChatGPT works, we ask a question, we pro provide a prompt with our request, and the the model then generates the word after what we input. So that's exactly what it is trained. So this kind of alignment between the training and its purpose is very important to, to my understanding. So that's why I highly think the uh, MAE for the image, the mass autoencoder like structures for the image is uh, much better than what ResNet has been uh, developed. But of course, it, it ResNet was developed quite some times ago, so 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 it's, it cannot cannot be compared in this way. Um, but on the other hand, we already seen like even even train on a very specific task, ResNet can can already give us a lot of good uh, embeddings for the images. But we envision like a better trained uh, model can 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 make this uh, make this whole process better, and especially again, for the purpose of the few shot or even zero shot learning. And for the question of whether there exist any so-called foundational models uh, for uh, for the medical image or, or, or more uh, general medical data, then of course, first of all, it's our Biomed GPT, which is already online, that the code is available at GitHub. But also I, I have seen some words from uh, Dr. Summers group. I, 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 I forgot the name of that work, but that, is, that work they use 
they use paired and uh, also unpaired uh, real reports and image data to train a very large model, which which then can be utilized for uh, a lot of uh, downstream tasks. So so I I can probably I can I can share with you the the title of that paper, but that is that is. That is done like two to three years ago, but I think that is a very good fitting to the idea concept of the foundational models. Sounds great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, but that, but that, is, that is only only limited to the uh, X rays. So so it's a foundational model for the X rays. Okay, got you. Thank you. Maybe we can take one last question and conclude the session. Uh, that question on ChatGPT uh, from Yu Bin Tong. Let me see. Yeah. So first of all, tuning the chat GPT. So so first of all, we cannot tune chat GPT by the way, because of the, the, the nature of it. Is it is it is not on, it is not an open model. It's a it's a very close model. We cannot tune chat GPT, but we can tune a lot of other language models such as uh Bird, such as the Lama and T5. So it, it can be tuned in the same way. So right now, what we are doing for tuning the model is not as complicated as it seems, because uh, because of the uh, prompt in, uh, the the prompt based method for tuning the model, and also we call it in context learning capability. So uh, one way of uh, so called pre training this large language model is is we follow what it what it has been done for training the models, and then we feed that with a lot very very large data set, which is Feasible, but actually in practice, it's not that feasible because of the huge GPU needed, and of course the huge number of data needed. But uh, the uh, commonly used, for example, alpaca scheme of tuning the models is has been shown very like uh, effective and requiring much less sample size. And the uh, the the introduction of the low rank. Uh, like approximation for the gradients, the LoRa based scheme makes everything even more smoother. So, so that is what what I talk about in like um, making a large model smaller. That there exist uh, a lot of attempts that we can we can out leverage or even uh, fine tune these models using a relatively smaller computational cost and smaller data size. So our so 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 for precise answer to your question, the our times in fine tuning the uh, lama uh, using the alpaca based scheme can work on the mimic data set that constitute uh, like uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of text, but that is a very reasonable uh, size data set. So. So we 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 have collected millions of texts in mass general and, and mail and and comparably mimic data set is uh, smaller because it is public and highly curated. So so you can use mimic to mimic size data to to fine tune a large language model using alpaca. So that is my answer. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Xian. Thank you for your wonderful talk and all the uh, discussion. Um, so with that, we can uh, conclude the uh, session here today. Thank you all for attending the webinar. Thank you. See you next time. Yeah, thank you, Pinkwin.